Ashley in Cutlass Hall for Hands on History Mudlarking Exhibition. The theme today is Knives, Weapons and Warfare. So you're going to see a lot of uh, battling, products of battle. Today is all about weapons, warfare and knives. So one of the oldest artifacts ever found in the River Thames, that's man-made, was found by David Hodgson, which is right down here. And it's a Paleolithic um, axe and it's 3.3 million years old. There's the man himself right beside you. Give him away. David, wave. you found the oldest weapon in the river town. Yeah, do you want to explain? And they would have hold it that way. So I have to do the skinning and cutting of the meat. So this is another stellar find that's here today. And this is from Lucas Olinsky. And it is a Bronze Age spearhead from around 1000 BC. So this is over 3000 years old. And another amazing one, this is an arrowhead again, uh, from around 2000 to 1500 BC. And this was found by Tony Tira. And you can see the kind of uh, tangs and the barb uh, and it's beautifully crafted. I can't imagine how they could nap this as a flint napper without breaking off these tiny delicate bits. Um, and this one was found by Mark Powers, and it's very similar, similar time period. So these are roughly 4,000 years old, which is hard to fathom. And it just kind of shows you how uh, ingenious and um, uh, innovative they were as craftsmen back at that time period. And this is one of my favorite finds ever. When I found it, it was uh, lying under the surface of the water, and I thought it was an old rusty bowl or pot or pan. And fortunately, I picked it up, turned it over, and literally cried out with joy that it was uh, an original uh, helmet from the um, fire guard. So those guys are the heroes that saved St. Paul's Cathedral and put out fires throughout London. And the reason why they would wear helmets is because, obviously, uh, London was being bombed, and all of this very sharp shrapnel was flying through the air. So this helmet wouldn't protect you from a bullet passing through, but it would protect your head from shrapnel uh, penetrating uh, through, the, through the helmet. So I just love this uh, tangible bit of history, and I can still even wear it. It doesn't quite fit me as well as I should, but uh, I love very, this. Very, still, still fit for purpose, you know? Now you've got this medieval knight's knuckle guard somewhere, yes, haven't you? Yes. I've always wanted to see that in oh, person. Yes. Oh, so this oh. is one of my stars. So finds. that is a knuckle guard from a medieval knight. And yes, it would have given someone a nasty jab. And we also have some chain mail from a medieval knight as well. And this was found by Mark uh, Iglius. And I borrowed that from him today. But it's nice to see these in combination. And if we go next door, we actually have the original sword that was owned by the Black Prince. And the Black Prince had gauntlets, which were very similar to these pointy knuckle dusters that you see here. So I just showed you the knuckle guard that I yes. found from a medieval knight. And if you look closely, this is the effigy of the Black Prince in Canterbury Cathedral. And if you zoom in, you can see the knuckle guards that are uh, pyramidal shaped, so very similar to the knuckle guard that I found. And if you look just on the right hand side, you can see his sword, which is a replica. But actually today we have the original sword right here in Cutler's Hall, which was made by one of the Cutlers back in the 1300s. And is now on permanent display in their collection here in Cutler's Hall. It's great to have that uh, connection with yeah, history. it really so. is. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jason. Oh, well, and of course, you. if you haven't yet bought a book, or there's two books here, written by Jason and also by Nick Stevens, then do get your hands on a copy of Mudlarks, Treasures from the Thames, and also Thames Mudlarking, Searching for London's Lost Treasures. And you have a lot of artifacts in this, yeah. and you're even featured in the book. So. I know, I'm yeah. in that book. <laughs> I am one of the treasures. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you are, Nicola. Um, I really love finding post-medieval bone dice. And um, I've got a lovely little collection here, all different sizes. Some of those are so tiny, aren't they? Yeah. And, and this is special as well. What we think it is, is the waste from bone dice production with test holes in it. 
So, presumably, it'd be a rod of bone, and they would have cut the dice as they went along, got to the end, can't make no bone or dice, and just threw it away. Trade tokens that I've actually found. So this is Michael Parks, who's the trader around the outside. Michael Parks, and there's a Noah's Ark in the middle. We have a Noah's Ark and a dove. Yeah. So what was he trying to advertise his trade as? So Michael Parks actually traded at Shadwell Dock in the East End. We've got his initial for Parks, M for Michael, and that's his wife's initial. Um, but the problem we have is when we look it up, in the actual trade token bible we have a different wife's name unfortunately his first wife elizabeth died in september 1658 and she's buried at st dunstan's all saints in stepney and he didn't hang around long before he married somebody else he married again michael parks of stepney parish marries mary mays of Wapping, and they didn't hang about either because on the 11th of February, 1659, the baptism record of Michael Parks, son of Michael and Mary, was born. And just like birth certificates today, it tells you the father's occupation. He is a chandler. And there's two types of chandlers. You have a tallow chandler, making candles, and you have a ship's chandler. So, a little bit more research and this is the coat of arms of the worshipful company of shipwrights and their motto is within the ark safe forever but if you look at the top of it we've got the Noah's Ark and the Dove so Michael Parks is advertising the fact that he's a shipwright at Shadwell Dock he would have lived through the Civil War the Great Plague and on the 2nd of September 1666, he was probably sitting on his dock, looking up river and saying, well, that's a pretty big fire up there. So trade tokens are amazing. Each one has got a story to tell and the records are pretty good. And a lovely message in a bottle. Oh, a message in a bottle. It's Hungarian. I do love a good message in a bottle. Hungarian one. And basically it's a lady whose partner's not treating her very well and she wants to find a really nice man to treat her well and look after her. The only problem is there's no phone number on there. On Easter morning, I found this uh, gold coin. It's 22 carat uh, gold guinea of King George III. And it's made in Japan then, so it's um, someone's personal item. That's why it makes it even more special. It's not only a coin, but it's actually someone's um, personal item that's been actually used and someone sadly dropped lost in the river. May I hold it? When does it date to? 1779. 1779 and it's a gold coin. An actual gold coin. It's really heavy isn't it? Yes it has some weight. So somebody's actually made that into a necklace and how on earth did it end up in the Thames? Maybe someone's chain broke off. Yeah. <laughs> And you can see the ring, it's actually made of different, uh, maybe nine carat gold, you can see different um, colors. So, How did you feel when you actually found didn't, that? I didn't think it was gold first. I saw it was uh, half poking out of the mud, so I saw it, it was shiny, but you never know, it might be brass as well. I didn't think it was gold first, uh, but then when I checked, like, and the weight, it's about right to be gold. <laughs> Maybe my second favorite is this torpedo bottle, or also known as Hamilton bottle. It's been deliberately done, this, uh, chosen this design, so the cork was always kept wet, so the carbonation is building gold. <laughs> and it has this amazing iridescence. It is beautiful. That's stunning. And it's usually flaking off, but this one is just, just in perfect condition. I didn't even need to preserve it, so. This knife was my recent find. It's a probably Victorian and bone handle, and you can see engraved ship and a lion on it. Oh, really? Oh, beautiful! Wow! 
I mean, my personal favorite's um, got to be this piece right here. So it's an ivory sundial. Um, it was made between, I believe, 15, 18, 16, 20, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It was um, made in Nuremberg in Germany. So it's amazing to think that this would have been, you know, kept on a sailor as he traveled to the Americas or to Asia or something like that. It's a, had quite an incredible story. So there would have been a pin on it which is now rusted away and there would have been a top half of it which would have had a compass uh, to kind of direct yourself. This lovely piece has kind of survived, you know, 500 years in the mud, which is amazing to think about. Look at these amazing bottles. Look at yeah. that. Just what was in there. <laughs> yeah, very happy with these two pieces. I found the small one and went back to the same spot the next day. Um, had no luck. I moved to a different location. I found a big one, so I had a streak of pop few bottle luck there. That's a dream. I would just love to find yeah. a bottle like that. And that's really such a lovely apothecary bottle, isn't it? Is that a cloth seal? It is, yeah. So yeah. this one here uh, dates between 1450 and 1550. It's got a depiction of the St. Paul, like the cathedral yeah. on the top there, and then just below the City of London crest. So I'm very happy to have found this. It was face down in the mud. Um, when I revealed it, I mean, my heart almost stopped. It was <laughs> quite something. And these lovely bone artifacts, yeah. tiny little dice there. Yeah. Surprising they lost them, so small. Absolutely, yeah. It's, I mean, all these pieces are really such unique pieces of, like, such unique pieces of history there. I mean, the amazing stories behind all of them and, you know, the different things they saw. A lot of these were used for kind of gambling and this small in the side. I love it so much because of how crude it is. I'm, mm. I believe it's probably a Roman dice, um, it's the location I found it in. Yeah. You can hold it if you'd like. Um, so which one? Are the, are the, are the, that one there, the ring and dot one. That is just so very, so very special. Yeah. Something that I haven't found actually, one of these tiny dice. Yeah, I mean it's really difficult. And these like hairpins? They are, yeah. These are um, Roman women's hairpins. I mean, to hold together the kind of elaborate hairstyles um, of kind of middle class Roman women. Um, they have these bone hairpins, these are just fragments. Unfortunately, the complete ones I have are currently with the Museum of London being recorded. But um, I'm still so fortunate to have been able to have found these lovely pieces of history. I love the way you've displayed your beads here as Thank well. Thank you, yeah. I mean, there are a couple different ages there. I've got some Roman necklace beads there, and also got a couple different, you know, post medieval beads, trade beads, there's a whole bunch there. Do you have a find that you would? Love to discover in the fortress something love you haven't discover. found yet. I'd love to find a Venus statue. These Roman Venus statues you can sometimes find. I mean, they're incredible. I've I've seen other people find them before. I love Roman history just because yeah. it's kind of it's the early you know start of London. You know, being someone who lives in London, it's just it's so incredible to think about. You know, like what's almost below your feet, right where you're standing. And what's that? This bird here. Yeah. It's um a kind of game that they used to play in the kind of 17th or 18th centuries. Uh, they used to kind of take turns knocking these uh, birds over, they're called shy cocks. They just knock them over with these kind of lead discs to win a prize. Oh, so that is, that, is that a tiny fish? It is, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to open this up fish. for you here. Yeah. It's, uh, I've been told it's possibly a herring fish, so an early sign of Christianity. Um, but it hasn't been identified yet by the Museum of London. Wow. So I'm still now waiting that's on incredible response. that you actually spotted that. Yeah, it's a tiny little piece. I'm not sure if it's lead, possibly bronze. It's uh, hard to tell because it's so thin. You've got a nice Samian ware potter's I do, yeah. maker's mark it's, um, there as well. I can just open it up. It's interesting because this one here, um, it's actually the side of a pot rather than the bottom. Normally, you find these stamps on the very base of a pot. Yes. This one here is on the side, that which is, uh, is curious. That is interesting, because the ones I've got are on the bottom. So yeah, this is unusual, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know who he is, this one? So I'm not sure. It says Remy NM. So I'm not sure if it might be for Remigius, or it's really hard for me to, to know. I found this one last week, actually. So it's uh, oh, still yet to be properly identified. Yeah. Relatively new. Thank you very much, Kate. Of course. Now I'm here with somebody very special now, this is Graham <laughs> Duroon, who is a veteran mudlark, who has been mudlarking since... 1970. Since 1970. So yeah. you are really one of the original... Well, it frightens me, I don't ...mudlarks. <laughs> and Graham has an absolutely astounding collection of finds, including lots of beautiful knives. Look at these. Gosh. How old are these? Well, they vary. This one here, Staghorn Handle, 1600s, about 1650, something like that. So that's Staghorn. 
Staghorn, yes, yes. So 1600s? Yeah, mid 1600s. Would that have been used to...? It's a domestic knife. Domestic knife, yeah, yeah. okay. This little beauty is a Tudor knife. A Tudor knife? A Tudor knife. It's got a, it's got a mark on which um, we don't know what it is, but there's no listings for Tudor um, cut marks. We can only start to know about them in the 17th century. But that's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, is that bone? Then, or yeah, that's bone. That's it's bone. bone. Yes. There's a, sp a Tudor spoon. That came from the river, but I got it as a retirement uh, present from the Natural History Museum. Oh, really? Um, another Tudor spoon here. Tudor spoon. Oh, they're beautiful, aren't they? I wonder what they ate from it. Maybe a nice big bowl of porridge or Whoa. stew. How did it get in the uh, in the river? How did it get into Queen Hyde's Dock? That's, that's the big question that you can never yeah. answer. How did it get in This is a Cromwellian spoon, Triffid spoon, right? Do you know what? I found one yeah. the other day. Well, I mean, I just found the top. Yes. And exactly that shape. So it's a Triffid. Triffid spoon. Triffid spoon. Yeah. And the mark, you see, you see, yeah. you see it in there? The mark? Maker's mark. Yeah. Make as well. so we've got some These are dress hooks. Dress hooks. Yeah, dress hooks. And uh, another thing, which this is a William shilling, silver shilling. Was it a love token? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's bent there. So, so what? So what it was? Somebody, some gentleman, yeah. fancies a lady, yeah. and she fancies him, and they get along, and, and he gives her, he bends it into this S shape, and that is a love token. They're and quite how did that end up in the terms then? Well, she probably saw this bloke with another girl on his arm. <laughs> and she <laughs> threw it in the river, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. And there's another one here. That is the that is a Georgian. Can you see it under the light? Yeah. That's a Georgian. Georgian second, I think it is. Oh, but it's been It's been engraved, it's been faced off and made shiny, and then they've done chapters engraved Mary Coombs. 1729. Mary Coombs. Whoever Mary Coombs is. Yeah. Who is Mary Coombs? We'll never so that's know. like a love token. Though. It is, yeah, yeah. That is just, I would love to find something like that. Um, the other interesting thing is this is a knife handle. That's a knife handle? Yeah, and there's a, there's a chap there holding a lady, and if you turn it over, he's got his arm round her waist. Very romantic. It is indeed, and he's got a sword, and um, that's probably about 1500. Made of brass around that period. So, what do you think about the huge popularity? Oh, it, of it's modern gone! Modern. It's gone! It's amazing. I mean, when I was down on the river in the 1970s, if somebody told me we'd be exhibiting in the Cutlers, I wouldn't have believed them. The same with St Paul's, <laughs> but um, it's the internet that's done it, and um, it's just amazing that we've got this popularity and people know about us. But I always think it's. It's a big family, but everybody I know who does this is so friendly and so willing to impart information. Truly wonderful. What about this? Um, have you got this? Oh, look at that. <laughs> Are you on? Gosh, how old is that? This is a, um, a Webley British Bulldog, mm -hmm. um, about 1880, and it was um, found under Chelsea Bridge. My lads Chelsea. found it. Now, the big question is, everybody asks, has it killed anybody? We'll never know that. We'll never know that. Graham, I've got to ask you about this because it is quite unique. Yes, it's almost rude, isn't it? There he is. This is the ape. He's got a, a little bonnet on. He's, that's a mortar and pestle. And he's either peeing into it or ejaculating, they don't know. Standing on a fish. So that's... <laughs> that really is... Yeah. It's, it's amazing, else, isn't it? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. And look at these incredible oh, keys. Yeah, yes. And there's one here. This is a wonderful key. That is. What would that have looked then? A huge church door or something? Yeah, or a door, a large door. It's about around about fifteenth early early sixteenth century, late fifteenth century. It's almost in perfect condition. So that's always the question. People come around and say, I wonder what door it opened. We'll never know, will we? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, okay. Graham. It's been a real pleasure to meet you and see your incredible finds. Pleasure to do this. Thanks very much.
And now I'm here with Simon Moore, and Simon is also a veteran model arc. How long have you been model arcing? When did you start model arcing, Simon? 1977. I'm glad you asked it that way around, because my, my mental arithmetic is not quite <laughs> as sharp as it used to be. <laughs> 1977, and Simon has the most incredible collection of finds, but a lot of knives here today. So all of these are found in the tales. Look at these. Aren't they spectacular? This one. Yes. I'm really curious about that one. Right, this one. Whoops, I'll just get it out. It's a, it's a puzzle knife, so it just doesn't open conventionally. The mechanism is a little bit worn now, unfortunately, yeah. but you have to rotate the handle around in a, in a complete circle to open up the blade. So there we go. It's, like I said, it's a little, little bit on the loose side. That's a little bit of a work of art, isn't it? But it does work. And it's got the cutlass mark on it, which might be an early Sheffield one. Right, so they have a cutlass mark, a lot of these knives, don't they? Yes. Here, which is really handy, I suppose, for identifying who made them. Yes. And what would this have been used for? Was this a so it would, it would have just, just been a, a multi-purpose pocket yeah. knife. If you turn it over, it says a trusty friend is hard to find. A trusty friend is hard to find? Yes, yeah, so someone a little, little mistrusting, obviously. <laughs> and then in God is all my trust, so... In God is all my trust. And then 1585. Wow. Just every time I look at something like that, I wonder who owned it. Exactly. In some, some cases, you, you, you do get... Um, Actually, some uh, owner's initials carved onto them. Yes. Oops, but the one you just stroked there. Yeah, that's got an initial on it. Yep. Somebody's carved their initials into that one. Yes, indeed. So, this is an early Sheffield knife. Yeah. And the, it has a little spur mark on it here. Yeah. Just there. Yep. And that one is actually recorded in the early Marks book of 1614 in Sheffield. Really? On the very first page. And those little knives, which are sort of Dutch Flemish, found in the Thames nonetheless, were, were part of a trend in the late 15th, early 16th centuries, uh, where they used to, used to have finial knives. So a lot of them have these little sort of copper alloy finials on the end, often horses, hoofs, or animals' heads. Uh, and so, so on and so forth. Oh, is, it, is that a duck? A uh, swan, I suspect. A swan and a dog, oh yes. yes. Yep, absolutely right. The detail. And occasionally you get one that's actually dated, uh, such as this one here with a little disc end on it, which says 1511 stamped into it. This one here? Yep, that's it. 1511. 1511, so again, all sorts of information actually on, on, on the knife's handle. Astounding. Thank you very much, Simon. And you've got a book here that you have written. Indeed. And you, yes, people yes. can buy that, can they? Yes, they can buy I'm that if they want. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> great. Oh, yeah. Where can they find it? Where can people find it? Um, there might be some copies left on Amazon, but uh, they, they, they are more expensive than the doubt of what, what I'm offering them for. So there are a few copies left. So Otherwise maybe it's out um, of print. people can contact you, perhaps, if they want. Yep. yep. Okay. Sure. Well, look at that. A must for anybody who is interested in cutlery. Thank you very much, Simon. Well, thank you. Great, thanks very much for your interest. <laughs> so here I am with Monica, a lady oh, yeah. who rocks. A lady who loves. We will definitely <laughs> recognise Monica. OK, here. well, this is my most exciting one. Yeah. So this one is a Norman Arrowhead. And this is a replica of a Norman Arrowhead made from a cast of this very arrow. Um, so this is like 1,000, 1,200 years old. So you found that? I found in that the in the Thames. And this was a replica made for me by a master arrowsmith, Will Sherman. Um, and he's, he's a lovely chap. During lockdown, I made a mould of this arrow and he made a replica, which is this beautiful thing, complete with um, wow. peacock tail feather, wing feather rather. Um, and in, so basically when I do a talk, I'm able to show kids exactly what that would have looked like when it was complete, which is just wonderful. It, it just brings it alive for the kids. Um, so that, that's been one of my favorites. This one I, I really love as well. So this is um, 1800, 1850 machete. Ooh. So would have been used on the tall ships on the slave routes. So could have, could have had some pretty awful jobs in the past, but also mostly used to machete your way through jungle to try and get water keep the keep the water levels up on the ship here we've got 
um, bayonet. That's the only one I know that's been found on the Thames, so it's not, not a common find. Um, I think it's about 1760, made of wrought iron. You can see the, the wrought iron marks on the, on the body. And it was probably a commissioned piece made for an officer. So it's quite, quite a rare piece. Um, this one here was lent to me by Alan Sutty, um, which I've put in here because it's so beautiful. It's, it's a fish spear. That really does remind me of King Neptune. Exactly, and old Father Thames. <laughs> yes. Stand there with your beer belly and your bits of seaweed and rope hanging off you. <laughs> and a, but very good to go and impale yourself. I've been impaling myself all through the talk on various different sharp instruments. Um, oh, we've got syphilis syringe here. Oh, syphilis syringe. This is quite exciting. I quite like my syphilis syringe. Um, and over here I've got my World War II goggle that would have been used by a um, Spitfire pilot, um, probably 1943 to 1945. And that's what he would have looked like in his full garb. And he would have flown in one of these planes in the, over the streets of London. And just over here, you can see an Econ 20 mil shell that would have um, been fired from a Messerschmitt. Um, so possibly the very, possibly the very, very shell that knocked this guy out of the sky. And I, I love it because it's still got the leather piece over his nose and you've got his maker's mark there. So when I took it to Hendon Museum, they were able to point out the, the maker's mark and the fact that it was an original flyer's um, goggles. So it's rather a cool piece. And we've got, oh, over here, this is quite fun. This is all our children's toys, which are all like war related. So we've got a 1700s lead cannon which is quite sweet. So, um, it's obviously been squashed over the years. Tiny little baby Spitfire plane, which is, uh, I absolutely adore. You can just imagine some kids sort of playing with that. Um, over here we've got um, uh, turn of the century, 19th century um, pea, pea shooter, a little toy gun. Um, lots and lots of horses, um, some of them quite old. He's, he's, I think he's 1700s, that one, the little flat one, yeah, yeah. Um, various different ones. Um, oh, we've got all the knives, hundreds and hundreds of knives as well. Um, that's my, my absolute favourite, the Dutch knife. That one is, I'm going to get it out, it's absolutely beautiful. So that's a wooden handle. Um, uh, it's got Maker's Mark, where is it Maker's Mark? Yes, Sorry, just there. there. Yeah. So it's quite beautiful. The blade may possibly be a Solingen blade imported from Germany. The handle was imported from Holland, found in London. So it shows the great trade routes that we have in central London. Rather impressive long pipe there. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love that. It's the longest one I've ever found. The oh, Del Dagger. Yeah, then that one is it's quite special and it doesn't look as special as it actually is. It's, um, I think it's an ebony handle. Um, absolutely so split in half but you can see basically where the tang of the dagger would have gone um, the rondelle is like basically a round drum on the end this was the same type of dagger that basically would have killed um, Richard III so when they found his skull they found a, a section on the back of his head where he had his basically an axe had lifted off the section but there was also a puncture wound where they expect a rondelle dagger with a very sharp stiletto end to put against the skull and bashed so that's basically, yeah, so these were actually quite serious weapons. Um, but it looks very sweet and innocent here, doesn't it? Thank you so much for oh, organising one of them. Very, very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm here with my fellow admirer of clay pipes, Jamanda Speedwell, and she has the Speedwell Asylum for Retired Pipes. What a perfect place for pipes to retire. Seeing as the theme here is weapons and warfare, weapons and warfare. I've got here um, eccentric weapons. This pipe is of this eccentric cannon, Horse Guards Parade. Um, it was very much ridiculed in its time. It became a subject of satire. So. Fantastic story, and they not make pipes of it. And also on the theme, we have someone battles, beautiful knight here. Oh, yeah, he is. 
Uh, set up a okay. beautiful French hand painted night pipe. And one which I think is most likely is about the Crimean War, the British French Alliance in the Crimean War. And here are some of my best pipes. Oh, look at those. Such a feast for the eyes. I love the dog pipe. Do you mind if I touch it? Yeah, sure. The dog pipe. Another dog pipe. Another dog pipe. Hand mermaid. Yeah, they really are. They really are spectacular. Yeah. We've got a fantastic collection. Thank you so much, Jamanda. Thank you. And now they're all happily retired in the Jamanda Speedwell Asylum. And if you want to see more clay pipes in the asylum, then hop on over to Jamanda's Instagram or website. You won't regret it. I'm showing a range of things you find on the foreshore. So I've got natural history. Natural history. Do you mind if I open up oh, the case so that there's no glare? So we've got natural history. Natural history. And um, um, shells. Shells. Uh, fossil urchin, fossil coral. Yeah. Boar's tusk. Lovely. And some of the shells are native, but others were probably brought over in the ballast since the coral. Yeah. Uh, because it has a military theme, I, um, Garibaldi was uh, an essential. Garibaldi, here. Garibaldi, here, yeah, he does sort of tend to roll over. Um, the tiniest pipe that you ever did see. Yep, a complete Victorian pipe. A little hoof, a little horse, a little foot. Lovely old, it's a 1600s pipe yeah, there, isn't yeah. it? Don't yeah. often find them so long, do you? Either. Yeah. Dutch one and that one is very rare because the pipe maker only made pipes for one year. The pipe maker only made pipes for one year. Is and, there a, um, a mark on the bottom? Yeah, RVL. That's RVL. That's RVL. RVL. Okay. And he didn't export them. What's your favourite find on this table? Not I haven't got favourite. I don't. I. You love everything. I, yeah, I can have my favourite find when I go on the porch. So of the day, but when I have a whole range of things, I'm stumped as to what my favourite is. Fantastic. Thank you very much for showing us your And now we've got Sam Willoughby here. Sam, you have got a very impressive display here. I have. Um, my favourite is uh, my uh, Roman bead. Um, so I found this on the Medway. Um, um, it stuck out like a sore thumb when I found it. Um, it was literally propped up against a rock. And um, when I found it, um, I wasn't too sure how old it was at first. But when I got home and uh, uh, did a bit of research and I found out, I was literally over the moon because it's the oldest find I actually have uh, um, in my collection. I've also got my um, um, murder bottle cap. Oh, a murder bottle? Yep. Now that's from an old baby's bottle, isn't it? Yes. Um, they were called murder bottles because um, of the tube that went in the centre through the hole. So that was almost impossible to clean. And tragically, um, it caused a lot of children and infants to die because of, um, it was so hard to clean. Back and. Um, Bacteria cause a lot of deaths. Yeah, and I see you've got some Lambeth workhouse <laughs> have, related yes. uh, pottery there. Yep. Now, um, one of the Jack the Ripper victims, Mary Nichols, she spent several years in Lambeth workhouse. Really? I didn't she know that. She could have eaten out that bowl. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Um, one story I did find out as well whilst I was researching the history of this piece, the um, Lambeth Guardian's piece, was um, of a strike that took place in a, um, um, a female workhouse. Um, three workhouse inmates led by a lady called um, uh, Annie Tolan were not very happy with the food they were being served and um, they, um, so they led a walkout and um, unfortunately um, it didn't go very far and all, uh, all three of the women uh, ended up being arrested and were up before the magistrate and um, unfortunately the magistrate wasn't very sympathetic either. All three of them were charged with refusal to work.
but it did spur changes to be made in the workhouse. So when we think of workhouses, we think of gruel and things like that. But um, later on, around the early 1900s, there was a conceited effort to make workhouse food more palatable. As well, time went on. Yes. yes. It's uh, a lot of watery cabbage soup and that kind of thing, generally, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you very much, Sam. You're welcome. Now I'm here with Rob Short, who has another incredible collection of finds. When did you start mudlocking? Uh, about six years ago. Six years ago. And in six years, this is some of the it's, objects that It's are just a little cross section. Just a little cross section. Uh, nowadays, I take more photographs and take stuff home because it just takes over your house. <laughs> well, I wouldn't understand what you mean about that. Yeah, I've, I've seen pictures of your place. <laughs> so can you um, show us some of your finds, please? Okay, um, as, as the theme of this weekend is war and, and swords and stuff, there's plenty of, of uh, deactivated ammunition in the Thames, um, parts of a mortar, Cannonballs, shrapnel from World War Two. Yep. So that's that's my contribution to the to so the, the weaponry and warfare. The weaponry and warfare theme, and also some copper spikes from uh, the warship's main deck. Oh yes, and we've got the is that a broad arrow it's on there. Yeah, it is. Because you, yeah. you didn't want the wheels of your cannon striking an iron nail, because that had. Uh, Set off the gunpowder, cover the decks, so you can use, use copper. Lovely selection of pipes here. Yeah, that's my favourite. That's probably from the Great Fire of London. It's that colour because it's been double fired. Right. Once to make it and the second in the fire. But it's the right shape. Yes, it is, that, isn't that it? For that, for that era. Yeah. Lovely. What's this? Is this from the river? Yes. Um, that's from a church, Riverside Church, that was bombed. Um, as in wartime, even now, if you've got rubble and rubbish that yeah. is kind of way, you have to pay. So you know, the, the canny vicar waits till nightfall, chucks it all in the river, and then 70 years later, it appears out of the mud. Love that. And that's been, it's, there's a little bit of crackage on it, but, but that's been washed and sealed. Um, it's probably too fancy to be on a pew, so it was probably uh, on a pulpit where the, the vicar gives his spiel. I like it, everyone else seems to like it. It's, it's, it's different. I love the padlocks too. Yeah. That's an, that's an early one, Yeah. because in the early ones they used uh, iron pins, but they tend to rust. So that's why you, you find ones now with, with brass pins. Yeah, I've got a few. Later ones. They've cleaned up really nicely, haven't they? Yeah. And I also love this little pot here. Oh. Herbal ointment. Love it. That is very nice. Yes. Awesome. Great selection of finds. It's just all rubbish. Do you have something that you would love to find? Yes, it is all rubbish, isn't it? We um, it. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I don't go out with the intention of finding a particular thing. I just go out and see what turns up. Yeah. Uh, I was quite happy with the weed curler, though, Ooh, because yes. well, most well, people well. only find halves of them. But, well, but well. yeah, a whole weed curler. Well, I was you happy don't need a weed curler, do you? Mark? No, no, <laughs> not anymore. But, but uh, the man in the corner shop was amused when I bought some hairspray to, uh, <laughs> oh. to, to keep the iridescence on. Oh, that's nice. That's really nice. It's such a good way of doing it, actually, isn't it? It's yeah, really I'm, nice. I'm never going to sell it, so <laughs> no. a bit of hairspray. Um, when it turned up, it was just like that, and I thought it was uh, a piece of glass. So I kicked it, and it went thunk. And I thought, ah, uh, oh dear, <laughs> have I broken it? But when... I scraped away and it all came out. Everyone on the shore heard. Ooh. Yeah, they all knew I found that. Yeah, I kind of know how that feels. So I'm waiting to add an onion bottle to the collection, but will I find one? I don't know. Maybe one day. Well, thanks, Rob. Nice little artistic display there. It's a sea monster. <laughs> Prove me wrong. 
Thanks very much. Thanks, Nicola. And I'm here now with Richard Henry, who many of you are familiar with, of course, because he is a brilliant expert on pottery. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Um, Glad to see you again. His book, shirt. Yeah, I've written this little book. I'm sorry, I should have made it a bit bigger. But it's a mere 598 pages, packed with pottery knowledge. Packed with pottery <laughs> knowledge. So if you are interested in pottery, yeah, I so highly recommend. Tried to cover the everyday pottery that people were using and throwing away right from the Stone Age up to the 20th century. So it's probably the only comprehensive one volume book that covers pottery you're likely to find mudlarking or field walking or amateur archaeology or digging your back garden where you find those little bits of blue and white this will help you identify them. And also Richard I have noticed that you've got a deadly medieval weapon here. Could you tell yes. us a little bit about that please? Yeah for once this is not pottery so this is made of antler which is a very hard bone and this is the nut from a medieval crossbow. So if you imagine you pull back your crossbow string and you hook it around that little groove there which is designed there and then inside where it's broken you can see it's got an iron nut there which connects to the trigger so when you squeeze the trigger it revolves the bolt and then that releases the string and off your crossbow bolt goes towards Richard III or whoever you're aiming at Right Absolutely there. incredible. Did you know what it was when you found it? No idea, <laughs> no. I thought it was a little bone pulley from a ship or rigging or something. And I found it in two bits quite close together, where the iron's obviously corroded and split it apart. And I put it on Facebook and this German arms expert came back and said, do you know what that is? That's part of a medieval crossbow. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. That is so, so cool. It's the only crossbow nut recorded anywhere in the country so far. This is the only one that survived. That's incredible. Because the Thames mud has preserved the antler. You know, if it was in a field, it would have rotted away by now. So, what an incredible find! A rare survivor, but so not who pottery for once. Shot yes. that and what did they Well, shoot? yeah, I'm rather hoping it didn't end up shooting people. I remember it was used for hunting, because that was the other use for them, obviously. Um, but yeah, medieval, by the time firearms started to come in in the late medieval period, they sort of really went out of, out of use, apart from hunting. Thanks very much, Richard. Yeah, that's all right, Nicola. Thank you. So if somebody would like to purchase your book, I suppose if they go over to your Instagram site, yes, they underscore can. pottery? Correct. They can contact me there and I can ship directly. Or it's also available on eBay and Etsy um, to purchase. So. Perfect. And I'm happy to send a signed copy as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. I've just bumped into Johnny Fielding, who has an excellent walking tour company called Bowl of Chalk. So I do pay what you want walks on weekends and then private walks for people who are on holiday during the week. So if you contact me, the website is, um, well, just look at Bowl of Chalk. But they're really Bowl original tours. Now, where can people find you on Instagram? Yeah, so all my handles are generally just at Bowl of Chalk. And then that's where, that's where it is. And can so, you just yeah. explain the Bowl of Chalk? Officially, I'm not from London originally, but it's Cockney rhyming slang for, for walk. So, although there are people who would disagree with that, but it's... Uh, proper cockneys but it's yeah so it's, you have to come on a walk and I'll tell you. Excellent yeah. so if you're visiting London and you yeah. want to see some parts of London that not many people have seen then get in touch with Johnny. Thanks Nicola. Thanks.